um, his presentation this morning is by Dr. Marvin Westwood, uh, who you all know, uh, on the Veterans Transition Program, Transition Focused Treatment. And I don't know if you know, but Marv received the uh, Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for his work on the Veterans Transition Program that was awarded earlier this year. Uh, it's a program that has received funding from the, the initially the BC uh, <coughs> Legion, uh, now from the federal government as well, also interest in this from the military in the United States and in Australia. So, very interesting to hear what you have to say, Mark. Right, thank you, Bill. You know, I'm presenting this this morning as the Veterans Transition Program, but let me contextualize it this way. My work really is in group work, and this is just one manifestation of group work. This population is a population that I started working with about 20 years ago for reasons that I think I've referred to before, uh, following up the narrative work I did with 85 and 90 year old um, World War II veterans. Before they died, they told us their stories about the war experience and how it affected their lives. And just to conclude that research project, they appreciated, they appreciated that we heard their stories. But as one veteran said at the end, when they stood up uh, at the end of the project and said, there's only one problem with your research, Westwood. It's 50 years too late. If we told our stories now, we should have had an opportunity to tell our stories about the military experience when we came home. So they kind of arm twisted me and said, whatever you do, make sure the younger vets, the younger men and women coming back, get a transition program, early arrival back into civilian life, and so that led to the development of this program. So that's how it come. So for the I'm here doing this is a legacy from the narrative research that we did a number of years ago, and that was also funded by the federal government. So the story today of the younger uh, men in this case um, is really reflective of the, the older men and women that we interviewed from the previous World War. Because uh, I'm in a, the counseling psych program, which is an applied uh, psychology program as I see it, I think our responsibility is not only to, to uh, teach, but also to research that has social impact. And um, we've, I think we've done that, so let me explain it now. Okay, the goals of the program are there. Um, what we try to do with the participants is to teach them to come to see the injury of military service, really, what's happened to them, and they refer to it as the baggage they bring back as a normal response to an abnormal event. And that's how I see uh, much of the trauma manifestation is it's a normal response. So you normalize their reactions, uh, which get them into trouble by teaching them, there's a teaching component, and the neuroscience now is very, very interesting, progressive, um, coming out of, of various centers that really helps uh, the participants understand my reactions are not crazy, I understand the activation, all the PTSD symptoms make sense to me, and they need to understand some neurophysiological um, information before they get moving. Then the behavioral symptoms are the symptoms that they will all know and you know about them. The behavioral symptoms of people traumatized, and it's the same for people from Auschwitz or the Second World War, or the wars going back to the time of the Greeks are all the same. When people go and do battle because actually killing people is not very good for anybody. I mean, I'm, I know that sounds fatuous I'm saying, but it's really bad that if you have to do that, and they've been doing it for 3,000 years. Why? Because it does get into the neurophysiology of the person. A flashback, a scene, a movie can remind them of something they did in the true act of service, which was the right thing to do, which will haunt them. And so they need to learn the, the link between the behavioral symptoms and what I call the neurological functioning, the sensory motor functioning, so it makes sense. What I like about working with vets, they kind of have a, a mind of thinking and problem solving, so they really relax when they can begin to understand, well, the reason that I'm having any is the reason I'm reacting is, oh, it's starting to make sense now. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm not a monster. Now, the trick here, and the reason that I like our program very much, is 
they're not going to tell their story unless they feel safe, because if they tell their stories in any military context, what happens to them? It's career suicide, because they're seen as weak and not fit for duty. So what they learn very early is never disclose what's going on for them. So their families and kids and so on live in a secrecy around an injury which came as a result of, and that's why now it's called an occupational stress injury. They're actually naming it the OSI. So injuries of trauma and war are an operational or occupational stress injury. And that's a term we use. We don't use PTSD. We don't use therapeutic terms of them. We will say, so you have an OSI, and they use that kind of language. And finally, then, we link it to current functioning, how are you doing now, and then future functioning, how can you get your life back in order, both personally, career, and in a social sense. So the other set of goals are more for us here in the how do you process, integrate trauma in a safe, structured, supportive environment? And by the way, all of these processes come from the areas of trauma research related to other sorts of trauma. Judith Herman at Harvard and so on, uh, when I was talking with her, she likes the idea of a group for uh, working with women with sexual assault because the support factor appears to be one of the biggest therapeutic <laughs> events, not the intervention by the psychologists. Mm -hmm. The social support, and that's also regulating those of you know that. So the group is an ideal place for when people are deactivated to start to do the work, because they do a lot of the helping of each other. Uh, this, so making meaning of the traumatic experience in one's client's life is really what you have to do. And so you have to re-narrate your story that, yeah, I did that, and uh, that was my job, and, 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 and how does that tie into my life story, what I tell my children, and so on. Uh, I think what I, when I, any kind of trauma that happens to people, there's an incoherence in their story. In civilian traumas, whether it's sexual, physical, relational traumas, the story's broken and people are confused. They can't put it together. Why? Because when you're talking of trauma, you're thinking of midbrain and the prefrontal cortex doesn't shuts down, so you can't really think your way out. Why am I reacting this way? Well, it's not governed by this part of the brain, it's governed by the midbrain, which is involved. And so when you understand that, then you have to learn how can I deactivate that, start integrating that into me in a thinking, feeling state. And so that's the exciting rewiring. Um, the term that they're using now, Van der Koek even talks about it in trauma, because trauma is about the body. It's what, uh, what would they say, what fires together, wires together. And so from a therapeutic model, what we try to do is rewire. You know what I mean? So we put, if in classical conditioning, we put in the most ter 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 terrifying memory situation a very stable, self-regulated, supportive environment. And over time, when they're there long enough, what you get is through classical conditioning, you get a different relationship between the stimulus and response. So what was previously fearful is now responded with just a memory and relaxation. But what the metaphor they use when they come up with their end is that, yeah, I remember what happened to me, but it's not like a video running in my head anymore, it's just more like a photograph. And I think that's for those who are doing narrative work, you understand that. So we, that's the narrative people come in line here, and Mark Buchanan's been involved with us as one of the researchers, and uh, is working across using a narrative methodology, and we also do quantitative methodology, so you'll see that here. Uh, the program, when you get down to it, how do we do it? Well, if you're working with a group of people, it doesn't matter what people, this is just vets, but any group of people who are traumatized and use a group-based approach, you have to build a really good, safe group. So you use a retreat site. So we have retreat sites that we go to. So there's phase four, there's a phase one, two, and three. They, they go to retreat for four days, one month between, four days, one month between, and then a two-day consolidation. Um, you can imagine why we would have a retreat site, and they go to nice places, not necessarily fancy, but it's quiet, there's uh, no disruptions, and they, they live together and work together, and so it's almost like an immersion experience, but for this population, they're used to living together uh, in barracks, and it's quite familiar. And so the hours that we have for the intervention are enormous, like it starts at 8 in the morning, and they are actively involved sometimes till 10 at night. The actual treatment program itself starts at 9 and go to 7, and you'll see why. But they never want to go to bed after. They want to sit and talk. And this, now they want to talk and relate the stories, but in a new way, a kind of a healthy way. So sometimes they stay up till 2 in the morning. And we, the therapy team's all crashed. We've gone to bed. <laughs> and they get up looking fresh in the morning. Like if you think about the adrenaline, so on operating. And it's like being in camp in a way. I remember when you used to go to camp. It's just that 
Uh, I'm just impressed with the amount of hours that are involved in being alert and awake. But they're used to hard work, so they, they really value that time together. So they live together, they work together, and uh, that's kind of key. Now this, for the psychologists in the group, the intake interview, is, of course, is very important. because they, There may be some that have been screened out because they, they cannot be stable in their group, or they're still heavy into addiction. So we have the team that screens them when they're ready for the group. Uh, approximately 100 hours. Intervention, 100 hour intervention, over three months. So if you look at common factors therapeutically, the relationship does seem to be the primary factor accounting for a lot of change. Uh, six to eight for a group, and there's the team. Um, the team is made up of their graduate students, because this is the, what we're doing here in our center is we're training graduate students. They come along, it's only two or three. There are RAs, researchers who want to learn from us. There's us, the team, um, there's a physician, there's maybe myself as a counseling psychologist, master's level in training. Um, then paraprofessionals are graduates of our program. We get some in-service training, how to work with others, because they really want to get back in and help. So if you look at the ratios, the team, the therapeutic team, is about seven, and the number of uh, clients is about seven, so the ratio is very favorable, one to one. But notice what we're doing, we're actually advancing graduate students. This is clinical hours that they can get, and they learn from us. And the paraprofessionals, uh, these are return vets, several of them have gone on to university and are now doing other careers be uh, because of their, they want to be in the health profession. So one thing I've heard about military, uh, if you look at, and they, what the, with military incorporates what's a common traditional masculinity ethos, there's a bad side of that, but the good side of it is this, that they want to help others, so the group, and that's one, they want to help others, they're not afraid of hard work, and they are determined. So we use those, we reconstruct those favorably, but so when we ask them if they want to join the group, and by the way, the best people to ask other vets in are other graduates, not psychologists, We'll say, do you uh, think you, you could uh, be interested in the group? Oh, no, I don't need it, but my friend does. Oh, okay, do you want to come along and help your family? Oh, yeah, I'll help my friend. And so sometimes they say we have a whole group of people. So none of you want to be here. You're just here to help others, aren't you? Yeah, we're here to help others. Well, of course. It's a face-saving thing. It's a little stigmatization. They can't say they, you know, if you imagine the training, to say they need help would be an anathema to them. But it's okay to say, I'm here to help others. And I say, well, I'm here to help others. Maybe you'll get something out of it yourself. Okay, so away we go. So that you get the so that's the kind of composition of the team, and this is the way uh, this is this is the program, and it actually has a little motor in here. So you're going to see this going to move. Be, before the program, they come they get referred by other people. All of these people, also family members down here, other vets will refer people to our program. <coughs> Our program is not a part of any government organization. It's a UBC program, separate from uh, any of the military organizations, and so they trust it. Confidentiality, we do no record sharing with either BAC or DND or any of the clinics. Um, so they feel very safe that way, and these people know that. And the, the military, if someone will be serving, they will never know that they've even attended the group. And that's a transition group, and that's what it's referring to. So here we go. They begin with first group building, and uh, you can imagine when you get a lot of people activated coming together, you have to first do a lot of group building, group structuring, so that they feel safe and get cohesion developing. And the way we do that is they do involve a life review process. The life review process you'll come to see a little bit later, and that's telling the story, and then they enact the story therapeutically. And in this process, this line here represents kind of level of functioning social emotional functioning. So when they do the enactment work and re reenact the critical events, you're going to see one on television here, is that the, the, all of the symptoms of depression and grief and stress kind of get highly elevated until they work through it and then they move up and out. And so when they leave the group, is at a higher level of functioning, our research is showing, than when they enter. And that's what should be happening. So. Uh, they call it the deep dive. They don't, we don't use clinical terms with them. Uh, dropping the bags, say, I'm ready to do the deep dive, I've got some hard work to do, <laughs> which are all true. And I'm fine with that. And they just call it that. Um, but they, and they will go and, they assist, and we assist them down. It's almost like descending into hell, like Dante's, Dante's Divine Comedy. 
is actually an excellent metaphor. You know, Virgil accompanies Dante down to hell, but agrees to come from back out. And it kind of feels like that for some of the things we do. Uh, when they're here, that's a whole other fascinating area of how through active enacting the self at an, at an emotional cognitive level, the physiological substrate is where you start to integrate the experience and I said kind of limbically and in higher order functioning level so that they so that they are kind of more smooth functioning. They do this by refocusing, reconnection, reconnecting back to the self. This uh, reconnection doesn't mean reconnecting to the group. They're already connected to the group. But let me explain and give an example. You see Todd on the screen. He actually gets himself back because many of them feel that a, a large part of them died given what they saw. Not just what they did, what they saw. And uh, so when they can get themselves back, they feel really connected to themselves. And then they understand what happened. And, uh, you can have what's called a stall, because the pain of recovering a self can sometimes, it can, it can be reactivated, so we have to re-regulate, re stop, start again, and it's kind of a relapse, like back into the trauma symptoms. Then recover yourself, and then up and out to uh, we do follow up with them for a few weeks, but the goal is to try to really relink them back into uh, professionals if they need it, and some don't need it. But this is the big one here. Um, they, they learn skills. We teach them skills. We teach them about how to career interface. But the skills and the career options actually is, is the last part of the group where they set life goals, uh, some career goals, and start to move towards them. So that's why it's a, a transition program. It's not just a therapeutic program, because ultimately, People want to get on with their lives and start making a living and become productive citizens again. So, guided by the biography, for those of you, you know, Pen and Baker's work and journaling, that's what you really They write a story of a critical event. They do two stories a critical event in growing up, pre military, and then a critical event that happened to them in their service. And we do the, we do the first run on life events and to normalize themselves and kind of get back into who they were, and then they talk about what happened to them. And this process is telling a story, writing it, telling it, reading it, saying it, and then getting reactions from others. And what that, of course, does helps with the beginning of the coherence of the story. And that's from Brian Deutschman's work that some of you know about. But that was the telling of the story, the enacting these. So we would say, and you'll see on the tape, the case of Todd and previewing Todd. Todd told the story. Um, and so he told it, and he, he suffered from what's quite common um, is survivor's guilt. You see, often they lose their mates that they're working with, or they can't save somebody, and that haunts them forever because they're trained to be able to back their, uh, their mates. Um, and when they can't or they die, they feel awful. In fact, some of them kill themselves because they shouldn't live. A lot of suicide you hear about the military. Or simply, if you look at the, read the clinical notes, the last thing they'll write is that I should die because how come you died? I let you down. It's all part of that influx. So we, what we do is try to intercept, break into that, and have them then bring that person back who they need to talk to or say goodbye. It could be a child that they couldn't save in a concentration camp or, <coughs> or someone they served with. So they reenact the story they told, which involves of course, a re-experiencing at a highly emotional body level with a lot of grieving, and then rethinking. So this is, it's an experiential approach. This model is experiential, and these are the domains that it's a it's a multiple systems model we use. Morning. Uh, going across these domains, and an audience like you get you know what these domains are. Start to say anymore. So now let's take a look. If you just shut the light up there, please. Okay. What you're going to see now is about an eight minutes clip of the whole thing in action. It's our program delivered in Australia. Uh, they invite us down as, as part of the ARC grant, the Australian Research Council grant. Uh, we work with them jointly to replicate this study, including the research there. And they, a film company came in and made a film uh, for them to use in the public sector. And so all the veterans in here have given permission to want this shown. And this is going to focus on the life of Todd. So just remember, Todd is someone that was not functioning very well, comes into the program, and he has a mission to achieve, and that is to, so you'll see it here, 
he really needs to go back and revisit an event where he was a senior officer and he lost uh, four, I think, four other men. And he feels responsible. He's not, but he does feel responsible, especially he's very connected to one of them. So he, he sees nightmares that wake him up, or he sees this guy's face all the time, all the time. And so his wife and his children are kind of being estranged from him for a while because he was totally agitated. And all the meds and everything weren't really doing it. So he basically had to let that go. So you'll see how it goes. And he, he teaches you about it. So I think right now. Usually, it's a retreat for a number of days. They eat together, they share dorms, which are like barracks. They have downtime where they actually end up talking till two in the morning. The soldiers know how to help soldiers. So we we take advantage of that. It's like a rebuilding of a community. So it's it's a group based intervention where there's a lot of support from them and from us, the professional team. Okay. So Todd, uh, we just leave the chairs where they are. Uh, as you know, we start by getting up and walking, moving, you know, getting mobilized, because often when we're, when we're walking and talking, it's a little easier to uh, kind of regulate ourselves. Uh, military people are already action trained, so the best therapeutic correction wouldn't be sitting and talking. That would feel awkward, uncomfortable, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't probably trust it as much. This is, the, this is Chris, the guy we heard about before. So what we do is... We recreate scenes and moments from their past through action methods. Often they've lost buddies who've been killed in action. They never going to say goodbye to them. They will choose someone to be that person. They will talk to them and say goodbye and release a lot of the grieving that they need to do. Their life close now? Yeah, his eyes are closed. He's, he's unconscious. We were barely keeping him alive. When um, people are in the middle of reenacting a very stressful event, thoughts are, aren't very clear, they have a lot of emotion, and they know they want to say something, but they can't think of the words. But we know from our own research that there's certain things that have to be said at certain critical recovery moments, which are very simple and straightforward, but they have to say it. I look, I'm aware. I'm aware that Chris is barely alive. He's still... But, and then I am feeling helpless. So what we would do is we would lead him with a sentence of uh, what I need to say to you is, and if he doesn't know what to say, then I'm so sorry. But because we know him and we know the context, we have an understanding of what it is he needs to say. There is nothing. There is nothing. I can do right now. I can do right now. To reverse what happened in the sentence. To reverse what happened in the sentence. The man in our country are socialized to not to share emotions. Uh, it's unmanly, but they soon discover that the way back for recovery and healing is to do just the very thing they're taught not to. I was there when they conducted the autopsy on you. I had to be there to protect you, to guard you. And I wanted to do it so your family knew that you were not alone. Mm. That for you. Our minds can't always differentiate between that reenactment from the original event. So they're able to go back into the story and finish it in a way that the helplessness is, is eliminated. And from then on, uh, they, they have a different experience, a, a different relationship with that traumatic event. Even though the rational part of your brain says it's not really them, there's a part of you that thinks it is, and that you really are back there and they're now alive and talking to you. It's incredibly powerful. Chris, I need to say to you that I'm sorry that you're passing. I'm sorry that you died. I feel that I failed you, that I couldn't help you and I couldn't save you, and I can't let go of that. And that I would never abandon you. And I can't forgive myself for it. And I can't forgive myself for it. There's nothing you can do, and I want you to hear that. I want you to see that. And I need you to let go of this or you to get on with your life. I need you to let go of this and to get on with your life. You will never be forgotten. The telling your story and enacting your story about your fears and your regrets and so on makes an internal state external. And they feel relief and can let it go so that they can use energy to get on with their lives. You won't return to the major. Return in my dreams.
finish because you're all with me. You finish because you're all with me. You might be inside me. So it's like you say, and that's why I'm going to cover you up. I'm going to cover you up. I'm going to walk out of the room. And then I'm going to walk out of the room. And I'm going to walk into the rest of my life. And I'm going to walk into the rest of my life. And leave. There was closure, almost relief. It was incredibly emotional. So I was quite exhausted at the end of it too, but um, I felt much the better for it for having done it. That's for sure. When you're walking in that circle and enacting your work, you're in the moment in it. And the uh, realization of what has changed in you, what has taken place, the, sort of the complexity of it hits you later. And that's really coming out that I'm still running my face, I've got my head down. And what we do is sit and look at their process. I'm asking them in each moment as we go through the video recall is to pinpoint places where something has changed. They notice some different emotion or they notice some different cognition or different feeling. And I'm trying to get under that to figure out uh, what that means. So when you were touching your face, what was this? What was that? Uh, I think it was just like a nervous, uh, maybe I'm trying to mask my emotions from the group. When I notice something that's changed or I see an insight that's taken place, I cue and I stop and say, what was going on for you in that moment? So when they answer that question, they're bringing to mind what they were experiencing, but also what that meant to them. What was the meaning made there? I don't, I don't remember this part at all. So you went, you went somewhere. But you were saying all the words. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> What's it like to see this now? Uh, it's, it's a bit of a shock. It's like the, some kind of defense mechanism has kicked in. And... Yeah, protecting you, because mm -hmm. it was really hard. There's a lot of insight and a lot of emotion comes up while they're watching what they did. It's a difficult thing to go back and relive that whole enactment, uh, but it's very beneficial to, their, to the change. To the healing process. Look, I wish I had it done the course years ago. It's opened up a new way of thinking about things and it's, I've got to meet some great guys that I have, now have the most up, utmost respect for. It's helped us build bridges um, with our families, ex-partners and with ourselves to deal with, um, you know, our emotional problems. I had a dream last night, standing at an airport, waiting for my luggage to come down. All the baggage was actually passing me by, and I couldn't find my baggage. I woke up with a smile on my face, I'm thinking that's very, very true. I don't know where my baggage is now. This course has helped me considerably to get rid of a lot. I don't seem to have that tension and stress that used to bottle me up. Um, I've had a huge release of emotions. Um, I know I'm not out of the woods yet, there's still a long way to go, but um, I've been given a bit more hope and a lot more optimism, optimism about the future, so um, I'm now keen to move forward and, and get on with my life. After seeing that, sometimes it's just good to uh, take a deep breath if you want, like to change your space because some people, uh, when they do that, it can remind them of events in their life or you may have in your family, uh, people who have served uh, in previous wars and you might, your mind might be going back to them now because that's a classic, that's a portrayal of a very classic repair piece for them that you can match. Um, I don't know if you noticed the it's David on the David the name of the uh, he's actually a psychologist in Australia the guy who's dead right and you notice his skin color during the interview we noticed it after he was aware of it watched it he's, as he was take, saying the role of the friend that died his skin color starts to become increasingly pale I don't know if you noticed it and he's quite white because he actually got into reliving the experience as if he was representing that person. So we monitor those kind of things also. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, I think that, that explains, shows it, doesn't it? Great, right. 
that's to on. Now, shifting the focus a bit, uh, we have a research, a couple of research projects going on, and uh, Dan uh, Cox and myself and the RAs and some other people have been following the, these people, and we're trying to get is a look at change over three months, pre, post, and follow-up in depression. And you know why probably we want to look at depression, because depression is highly indicative of potential suicide. Severe depression and suicide, you know, they ride together. And there's a lot more literature about suicidality among returning vets. And my view is that suicide is really just an act of stopping the pain for them and they normally wouldn't kill themselves if they were normal functioning, but with a severe depression, you have disorganized thought, and uh, and so that's we even you know Health Canada, the military is very concerned about now, and they're look, helping us look at the if you can look at depression as a as a perhaps predictor of potential suicide risk, then that's where we want to go. So we could do that with you know, conventional measures like the BDI. So let's just look at. This. Um, the entire, we did a sample of 52, and uh, severe depression, moderate depression, all depression, minimal. Well, this is the group we would be really interested in, isn't it? But the ends, you see, so when we put them all together, uh, you can see when the effect size is very significant to change, but that includes people who are minimally depressed, so what we thought. Let's look at mild, moderate, and severe. Reduce the number to 39. We're still noticing the differences, significant differences. Then just looking at miles, you wouldn't expect a big change. Like if people come in mildly depressed, not all of our, our uh, participants are depressed, so if they enter mild or minimal, they're not going to notice a change. But this is the group here, it's a pretty small end. But notice that. This is the group that are at risk. Oh, sorry. Severe. 17. Uh, that was their depression rates before and then after the effect size there. Um, it's encouraging because not only do they start getting their lives back together when you're not as depressed, so if you move from severe depression to mild depression, you can function. Being a university professor, you can function quite well with mild depression. <laughs> 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 That's me all. <laughs> so I'm feeling that they did, oh my god, there's all this marking to do. Or, I think that writing uh, CHR grants leads to severe depression. Um, yeah. um, and I think uh, short grants groups can risk moderate depression. So I think we should do a study in the ECPS faculty and BGI on its, on its application. You know, that's just my story. So I, I really, I'm really happy about this because we're putting together. Um, oh wait, the drawball rate, really significant. We've had none in the study. And we've got over 400. Wow. And if you look at all the military research, about 30% drawball. If Dan was here, he'd be talking about that. Um, most studies, when you open the journals, they right away say drop out. And guess what? The other question is when we present. We presented at School for Barracks in, in Hawaii and in Los Angeles at the hospital there. One question is you know, how many suicides have you had? They always ask how many suicides, and we've had no suicides, and that's doesn't mean it won't happen. But uh, we have a big selection factor. But I'm just so happy that we have it because that would feel personally very off. The current research going forward is we just got or we started the, this the new research. Uh, paradigm here. Uh, we're doing time points, it says prior to, immediately after, three months after, 12 months, 18 months following the VTP, and the constructs of assessing are these. So we've got approval, we're going to be expanding, so we'll be followed up. The other area of research I want to comment is the research that Marla has been helping Dan and I on, and that's the using uh, the IPR, Interpersonal Process Recall, a qualitative method, you know, Kagan's model, where it's, whatever Todd does, the does the enactment, and then within 24 hours, someone meets with him, and you go through the um, re-observing, and stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, because he's not activated <coughs> anymore, and you can actually integrate more of what he did. And that seems to lead to a, to a higher level of integration of the trauma. If you not only do, do the intense 
enactment after the life review, but then you do a little more at distance integration, and you saw her doing that. So that's the qualitative part of the research that's going on. And funding for that um, project, this part of the project is still coming from now uh, the Royal Canadian Legion here, and we've got some other funds coming. So it's quite labor intensive, as you can imagine. Now this. But well, I think we're in within time. All right. Thank you very much.